So if you guys have your Bibles or your device, we're in Acts 21. Uh, and as you turn there, just a quick question. Does anybody else feel like it's 3 o'clock in the morning on Monday yet? <laughs> Because that's where I'm at. So uh, don't be alarmed if I lay down and take a quick nap during the sermon. Uh, I haven't put myself to sleep. I'm just a little tired. But in all seriousness, great to be here with you. I uh, want to give you guys kind of just an overview of some of the things we accomplished uh, so that our church family is aware and continues to pray for us. Uh, but did have an opportunity to go to Cambodia. Had a small team go to Cambodia, uh, accomplished quite a few things there. Uh, one of the things we'd always do is we go to this remote village uh, where our main missionary, which happens to be my son, goes and does pastoral training. Um, and we were able to do that, do some pastoral training in this remote village, as well as doing a, an outreach for the kids in that area. So that was amazing. One of the really cool things we got to do on this trip, and it really kind of surprised me to be honest with you. Anybody who's been on a mission trip realizes it almost seems like just one of the standard things you do as missionaries. You go and you do a VBS. Well, everybody does VBS, right? Believe it or not, this church in Cambodia that we were visiting had never done a VBS before. Uh, and so we had the privilege of not only hosting a VBS, but also training the young leaders there to continue to be able to have creative ideas on how to reach out to the children in their community. And so that was an incredible work as well. I uh, did a couple of uh, like work project things, H had a couple of, uh, of us that went down and we built a humongous swing set for an orphanage there, as well as a a toy chest. And yeah, I mean, that, that looks really cool. Can I tell you, I, I actually helped, but um, I think I did a lot more watching than helping uh, because it's not really my niche. Uh, one of our team members, Kevin, uh, just kind of one of those crafty guys. We went down and got some wood down at one of their lumber yards, which is an adventure. Almost took us a full day just to get material. And then somehow, how some of you guys are wired like this, he just puts it together magically and tells me, cut here, put a hole there, let's put it together, and it comes up and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool, huh? I mean, that came out really well. Uh, not only that, we had a chance to go to uh, the first graduation ever of what is known as the Water of Life Bible College, which again, my son is the dean of the school. Uh, so it was quite an honor to be able to see these first uh, eight or nine students graduate uh, from this Bible college. And so we were able, and, and believe it or not, I actually got to wear a cap and gown for the first time in like 30 years. I was like, wow, th th I remember this. That was a long time ago. Uh, but good stuff. And then we did a couple of church services, those things. Then the rest of the team headed back here to California, and me and my son went to Nepal. Um, one of the things that we wanted to accomplish, because I was kind of already on the other side of the world, is a ministry opportunity that had been presented to us uh, just a little bit before we all left. And uh, there's a ministry in in Nepal called the, the Home of Joy. Um, and uh, some, some people that are a part of our family here at Impact introduced us to this ministry. Uh, both me and Pastor Ryan uh, met with them and kind of got the vision that they're after. And I said, hey, while we're there, let's go and, and kind of see them and see how maybe we can pray and uh, start the process of maybe coming alongside of them as well. All I can tell you is this about Nepal. Um, I've been a lot of places around the world. I don't think I've been anywhere that is as poor as Nepal. Uh, I mean, it is very poverty stricken. Um, not only that, it just kind of has this crazy culture. It's primarily very strong Hindu faith. Uh, and, and I bring this up not to bag on someone else's faith, but it, within that faith and that practice, they don't value women. Uh, they, they look at women as more of a burden than a blessing. And because of that, this ministry has come in and, and tried to show value of these young women's lives because so many of them in that country are being sold into the sex trafficking trade, you see. And, and so what this ministry does is they find these, uh, these villages that are kind of, you know, in little shanties and uh, they'll begin to develop relationships with some of those families uh, that have some of these young women and they begin to kind of adopt, if you will, these women. They don't take them out of the home, but they show the families that they are valuable. Uh, they'll pay for their education because higher education in a lot of countries costs money. Uh, and so they'll provide those funds as well as an after school program that is a job training. Uh, so teaching them sewing skills and computer skills and uh, music skills and different things. And the idea is, is that they go and now they say, wow, there is value in my daughter. 
I don't need to sell her or try to get rid of her because she cost me too much money. Uh, and so an incredible ministry. And again, I just say I know uh, a lot of you pray for all of our missionaries. Uh, if you are ever curious about who our missionaries are, you can find it on the website. But encourage you to pray. But would you do me a favor and add Nepal onto that just so you can be praying uh, with us and with the pastoral team to, to see what God's leading us in that area as well. Uh, I give you all that because I feel like I need to share with my family why I've been gone for the last three weeks, uh, but it is good to be back and good to be back giving uh, God's word uh, the, the honor and the, the blessing that it deserves. And so Acts 21 is where we find ourselves. Let me give you a little context. We've been going through this journey of the book of Acts. You see, first of all, that there's the beginning of the church, right? The very first chapter, go and be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit's power has come upon you. Then you begin to see these kind of journeys that are happening. First, the scattering of the disciples, and, and then they move out. And then you begin to see Paul come on the scene, and that's where we're at. This is actually Paul's third missionary journey. Now, I, like I said, I just got back from the mission field, and it is a little taxing. I mean, you know, you, you go from one airport, and you go through customs, and you go through all of these different things, and you're like, wow, this, just to give you a little bit of an idea, my trek from Nepal all the way back uh, to LAX was about 45 hours, um, and so it's a lot of traveling, and then I read about Paul, and I kind of hear God saying, why are you crying, Right? Like, I mean, this guy was on a boat, shipwrecked, just doing radical things. Uh, I mean, this is who we're, we're studying at this point in Acts chapter 21. And what we're going to focus in on today, I'm just going to hit you up front, is probably something that's going to be a little tough to hear. The message title today is simply, What Will You Do? And the emphasis on the word will, because you're going to see God's will really opposing at times our own selfish will. We see Paul confronted with this in this story, but I want to just kind of set the stage to be reminded today of who we all are. The reality of who we all are is we are selfish by nature. I mean, the things that we do and the things that we witness, don't they speak to that even in the world around us? I mean, as I travel, it's always one of those things I do. Is anybody else out there a little bit of a people watcher when you're out and about? I mean, isn't it interesting to watch us human beings kind of interact and do their thing? Uh, well, when I'm in airports, I see this selfish nature thing coming about all over the place. You know, you, get, you go from this line to that line, and you got people trying to cut in line and, and trying to get ahead of the game. And it's always entertained me when you're just about ready to come to the end of the tarmac and everybody wants to get up and get their bags so quickly so that they can just stand there and do nothing. Like, I mean, it's going to be so important if you're two people ahead in the line to leave the plane. But again, what is all that? That's just kind of the selfish nature. It's more about me than it is you. And I got to get ahead and I want to get to customs fast. And we see people cutting in line, doing all of these things. Another one that speaks to me in my everyday life is the 215 freeway. <laughs> Aren't we just like selfish people? I mean, and it's just like this group of selfish people who are all on the same highway at the same time. We're trying to get ahead. He's trying to get ahead. People are, and you're just, they're driving you nuts. You're driving them nuts. What is all that from? Because everybody is more important than everybody else. That's just who we are by nature. You know, we've heard these messages where you see, well, you know, sin nature and the selfishness isn't something that's taught as something that is inherited that we understand it even from a young age. And uh, one of the occasions I was in Nepal, you know, it was this really humble church. It was up on top of this big hill. And I mean, humble in the fact that, you know, that they didn't even have chairs. Everybody just sits on the floor and, you know, kind of this little shack and they're kind of doing their thing. There's probably 20, 25 people in the church. And I notice as they're kind of doing worship and they don't really have all of this. They don't have a lot of instruments. It's just kind of more, you know, audible and they have some tambourines and they kind of had like one of the little drums. One of the little kids, there was an extra tambourine. He grabs it. And I mean, he's this little guy, probably like two, three years old. And he's walking around. And next thing I know, in the middle of worship service in this church, Two kids are fighting over the tambourine. Again, where does that come from? It's our selfish nature, isn't it? I mean, this is just who we are as human beings. And I bring all this context because 
what we're going to be challenged with, not just today, but for the remainder of our life as believers in Jesus, is will we allow his will to supersede our will? Will we surrender our will to him and say, God, not mine, but your will be done? Don't we see this example even in the, the story of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane? You guys remember the story with me? As, as Jesus is there, it says there's this, you know, there's all of this pressure that's building up. He understands what's in front of him. The, all of this suffering, all of this pain, even separation from God the Father as he takes on the sin of all humanity. And Jesus, it says, kneels down and prays and says, if this cup of suffering could pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Showing that even in his humanity, not that he had any sin, but there's still this, hey, you know, I mean, if there's another way, this isn't looking like it's going to be a lot of fun, but it's about your will. It's about the will of God. That set the example for all of us. And I wonder if we are fulfilling the will of God in our own life. You know, when I think about the will, what we need to understand is from the very beginning, God explains that human beings have free will. We have free choice. It's called volition is the big word for it, right? I mean, you see it from the story of Adam and Eve. We know the story of Adam and Eve, right? There's this garden, beautiful place, paradise is set up. Uh, there's everything that they need that's in this garden that's provided from them. And God says, one thing, this tree over here, my will, what I'm asking you to do is to just avoid that one tree. And so I, I just kind of imagine the story that maybe day after day they walked by and they had these questions. I wonder why we can't. I mean, is, is that big of a deal? It's not like God forbid them as far as blocking it and no way they could get to it. They had a choice to go to it. But they had to say, no, we shouldn't do this because God told us to avoid it. Isn't that a picture of our life every day? I mean, there's things in all of our lives that we realize God's telling us, hey, we should avoid these things. We should be a part of these things. And we walk by them. And it's like, should we? Should we not? Well, we know the story of Adam and Eve. There came that occasion when they disobeyed the Lord, ate of that forbidden fruit, and sin entered in to humanity. It's easy for us to say, well, you know, Adam and Eve, man, they blew it for the rest of us, bro. I mean, if they would have... If it wasn't Adam and Eve, it would have been their kids or their kids after them. If it would have got all the way down to you, it would have been you because I know it definitely would have been me. Can we just admit that we have this nature that battles against what God is calling us to do? That's what we're going to see in this story. But selfishness is something that God warns us about over and over and over again. The Psalms talk about selfish gain. Galatians talks about selfish ambition. James talks about self-seeking. And Philippians, one of the probably the more famous ones that we read, says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but let us esteem others more highly or better than ourselves. Why do you think that God had to put that in there? Because it's natural for us to be self-seeking. This is something that comes natural. And so God's like, let me reshape your mind a little bit here. I don't want you to be self-seeking. I want you to be thinking about others as well, because that doesn't come naturally. Self-seeking. I end kind of with this thought as far as our setup. When it comes to our relationship with God, is it more about our expectations about what God can do for us? Or is it about the gratitude about what he's done for us? I mean, there's a big difference there, isn't there? I mean, that's even why we've seen some of these wacky doctrines come in. It's like, okay, well, yeah, I'll ride the Christian train. I'll get more money and I'll get a bunch of stuff. And I mean, that sounds like a good plan for me. Where do I sign up? But what happens when things get rough? What happens when things don't go your way and according to your plan and your purpose? You throw your hands up and you say, well, I thought God was good. Apparently, he's not good because my circumstances don't seem good around me. What we need to understand is, is that God's will so often is opposed to our own sinful nature. What we even think is right, it says there is a way that seems right to a man but in the end is death or destruction. 
What I find interesting about that proverb is it was like God had to put it in there twice. It's in chapter 14 of Proverbs and then again in chapter 16. You know, Proverbs is kind of one of those books of wisdom that you're supposed to read and go, okay, that's a really good point. And it's like God was like, you know what, two more chapters, let's say it again to them in case they didn't get it. Uh, there is a way that seems naturally right to us because of our human nature. But in the end, it's destruction. And that's why God brings his will to us. And John, in the Gospel of John, we see this story of Jesus. And so often we see that Jesus would go back, as all of these other Jewish males would go back to the city of Jerusalem, that holy city, to celebrate these Jewish feasts, remember? And one of those occasions, this is in the middle, and even really towards the end of Jesus' ministry, there's kind of this conversation that takes place. You know, I mean, Jesus has done miracles. He's had, you know, these different times where he spoke to people and they were like, wow, like, man, this is amazing. With such authority, he speaks. And even his brothers who say they still do not believe at this point, they're beginning to try to give Jesus some counsel. You see, and what they're telling Jesus is this, is, hey, I understand, man, you're getting ready to go to Jerusalem. Man, you've been doing all that cool stuff down here in Galilee. What an opportunity. You know the stage you're going to have in Jerusalem. You know the crowds that are in Jerusalem. Man, if you do some of those cool tricks there, everybody's going to believe that you are who you say you are. Man, Jesus, you should put on a show there. And what does Jesus say? It's always intrigued me. No, it is not yet my time. But I think within that story, you find something that's a little bit more direct and speaks to what we're talking about today. You see, what Jesus says is this in verse 17 of that chapter. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. You see, he talks about the heart. He's like, hey, it's not about what people are going to see with their eyes. Yeah, I could go and, you know, I could put on a big show or I can do some miracles and people will be like, whoa, I mean, this Jesus dude, he's awesome. Maybe he is the Messiah. I've heard that rumbling and maybe he could get up and do a killer sermon and people will be like, oh, but Jesus is like, I'm not interested in entertaining people with their eyes. I'm interested in changing them from the inside out. You see, that's what this message is all about, is for us to realize that God works from the outside, I mean, from the inside out, not the outside in. You see, so often our will, our selfish will is based on what we see, what we feel, what we hear, everything that's in this physical realm. And so it can lead us astray. When my circumstances aren't really going the way I want them to, I throw my hands up and say, God can't be good or this wouldn't be happening. But have you guys read any of the Bible? I mean, that happens over and over and over. It's like a broken record, isn't it? I mean, Job, that's a classic one, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about this guy who says he's a righteous man before God. He's blameless. And yet he loses, first of all, his family, then his finances, go on down the line where he is basically stripped of everything. His friends are telling him to curse God and die, and yet he remains faithful. Why would God do that to poor Job? Have you ever thought that? Then you read some of these characters like Daniel in the lion's den. Yeah, we focus on the lion's den, but this is a guy who stood up for God. Hey, there's a decree. No longer are you going to be praying and doing those things. You can only honor the king. And what does he do? He opens his windows, gets down on his knees three times a day and prays to the heavenly father. Ends up being thrown into a lion's den. And we know the story from there. I mean, go on and on. The Josephs, the Davids, all of these different guys, their life at times had some turmoil. And yet so often, if we're just trying to run our life and say, God, I have certain expectations of you, when those expectations are no longer met, what does it say about our relationship with God? It's hard to trust him through the process. You see, what I want you guys to understand today is simply this, and that is, is that God's will isn't always comfortable. God's will isn't always comfortable. And not only that, we need to understand that God's will requires courage. It's a challenge. 
I mean, I, I'm just kind of one of those straight shooters. I'm not going to try to fluff anything up. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. I'm going to tell you some of my own experiences, and I know we probably could take turns coming up here knowing these exact same truths that we've had some difficult times, but in the end, you're like, wow, I don't know how it all worked out, but God was doing something behind the scenes. God was working something out. I, I mean, it, it's amazing to look in hindsight, but it's so difficult where you're in their midst of it, isn't it? It's not comfortable all the time. And I mean, if God just wanted to present this picture that you would read this book and say, oh, it's so amazing. Of course, I'm going to sign up for the, the Jesus thing. I mean, look at all the things you get. But he tells the stories about Paul now in this one. I mean, there, he's going to be warned not to go to a certain place, Jerusalem, because he's probably going to get beat up and thrown into jail. We've already read about Paul. I mean, one time he gets stoned to death. I mean, think about that in your mind's eye. I mean, you're getting up there, you're trying to glorify the Lord. Next thing you know, a bunch of rocks are being hurled at you, hitting you in the head. Next thing you know, you're like, you're stunned, you're dazed, you're down. They're still throwing rocks at you. They think you're dead. They pull you out of the city. Like, okay, finally got rid of this guy, man. He's causing a bunch of problems around here. Paul says that the disciples came and prayed over him. All of a sudden, he gets back up. I'm sure dazed. Who knows if he even had a concussion. He was like... Uh, where was I? I need to go back and finish that sermon. I mean, this is radical. I mean, but to me and, and the natural man, that's not a good sales job by God. You know, I mean, if we were a salesperson, we wouldn't say, hey, you know what? If you go and you do the sales pitch, here's what's probably going to happen. You may get killed. I, I'm going to look for another job. But God is truthful and God wants us to understand that his will sometimes isn't comfortable. With that context, let's get into the story today and expound this truth. This is picking it up in verse 8. The context is, is now Paul's been bouncing around, right? Doing these different ministries or doing this different mission trip. Going from town to town and presenting the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is. Going back, we saw even at the end of chapter 20, to Ephesus to strengthen the church and to build leadership up so that when he leaves, the church can continue. It tells us that even in Ephesus, these guys were crying. They, they, they didn't want him to go, man, Paul, you're so awesome. We love it when you're here. We have great relationship. He's like, yeah, but God's will is for me to move on. And God even uh, reveals to Paul that there is going to be danger in Jerusalem. But he says, it is my will that you go to Jerusalem. But let's pick up the story in verse 8. Now going from these towns to town, it says, Now on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And while they were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people uh, there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Again, one of these extreme radical examples that we see of Paul saying, it's about the will of the Lord for me. It's not about my comfort. Yes, it takes courage. But this is what God has put on my heart and I'm going to move forward because God has revealed this to me. You see... Let me digress for just a moment and give you a little bit of biblical context because there's a little bit of debate between the commentators is what is going on here with Paul. Because it says that there's this prophet and it even states there in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is speaking through this prophet to Paul. 
and saying, hey, um, here's what's going to happen. I mean, you talk about a dramatic setting, right? I mean, I, I would imagine that he was kind of wearing one of those little cloak robe type things, right? And had, maybe had the belt tied around, the little rope thing. And, you know, whether he took that off or whether he wasn't on and he grabbed it off the floor, it's not specific. But now this guy binds his own hands and he says, this is what God is saying to you, Paul. Even his feet. And he said, this is what's going to happen if you go to Jerusalem. And so what commentators will debate is, is that was Paul out of the will of God here or not? The Holy Spirit said, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, some would say, yeah, he, he was out of the will of God. Others will debate and say, well, that's what was said, but also the commentary that came after was not inspired by the Holy Spirit when they followed and said, so you should not go. You see, the statement was, here's what's going to happen. Their commentary was just, you shouldn't go because of that statement. You see, what I believe happened is, is that Paul understood his call, it tells us in chapter 20, was to go to Jerusalem. And I mean, I don't look at Paul as a dumb man. Wouldn't you guys agree he was pretty intelligent? I mean, he wrote the majority of the New Testament. A pretty sharp cookie. And you think when he thought about going to Jerusalem, he's like, oh, Jerusalem's going to be so cool, bro. I mean, it's so fun there. I mean, talking about Christianity to the Jews. And I mean, they never have any problem with any of us. Wait, let's rewind the story. The Lord and Savior was publicly executed in Jerusalem. Of course they knew it was going to be tense. Not only that, they had started driving Christianity out of the holy city because they said, hey, this is conflicting the Jewish faith. So of course Paul knew that, but my personal opinion is as Paul said, I'm doing God's will no matter what. Yeah, I, 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 there's probably a really good chance I could be in prison. And Paul's like, it happened in every other city. Why wouldn't it happen in Jerusalem? But I want to do the will of the Lord above all things. You see, he was willing to follow God's direction wherever it took him. And the question that we must answer today is, do we have that same heart? Or are we trying to use God as some big vending machine in the sky, some genie in a bottle, that when we need access to him, we want to cry out and say, God, I need you to fix this. And as soon as it's fixed, then we move on. And when things get tough and when life throws you some curveballs, are we throwing our hands up in the air and saying, God, I thought that you were a good God. Why would this happen if you're such a good God? Can you imagine if all the characters that we read about in the Bible did the same thing? Can you imagine if Daniel would have done that? Can you imagine if some of these characters we read about even in the New Testament would have done this? I can tell you what I would imagine. None of us would probably be sitting here today because Christianity would not have moved forward. But they were saying, this is what God has called us to do. And that's what we will do above all things. You see, it is definitely not always comfortable I'm sure you have your own experiences, but let me share a few of them that I've had with you. You know, I'm sure we could all march up here and say, there was a time in my life where I didn't, I didn't understand how this was working out, but now in hindsight, it makes sense. My journey through ministry has been one that has been challenging at times. I started out in ministry professionally as a youth pastor. And, you know, things were going really well. And, I mean, the church was growing. The youth group was growing. We had great relation. Everything was awesome. It was like, man, this is amazing. They moved me into the role as a missions pastor. I'm like, I love doing missions. This is great. Man, we're going to build some momentum. This thing is going great. And then all of a sudden, I get called into an office. And I'm told that it is time for me to move on because God is calling me to be a senior pastor. And I said immediately, I didn't get the call. <laughs> Doesn't he know my phone number? I don't always have the most tact. I don't know if you guys have got that about me. But moving past that, obviously, I mean, at this moment, I'm thinking, God, I've been serving you faithfully. I mean, I moved my family out. I know this wasn't a big stretch. I moved my family from Hemet to Menifee. Thank you, Lord, right? Um, <laughs> But, you know, I relocated and I'm doing all of these things and I'm pouring my life and my heart out, going on mission trips, discipling these kids. And now all of a sudden I'm left with now a new mortgage, four young children and a single income that was mine that no longer is there. God, if you're good, what's going on? 
Well, shortly after that, I, in faith, started a church called Calvary Hills. And I saw God start to move. And God start to, to, to make provision for the church and for my family. And we started to grow. And we ended up even being in this building after a year, not here, but where the family center is. And, and we began to get this building project. And it was amazing. And it was a $100,000 building project. And we were debt-free the day we moved in and started the church. It was an amazing work of God. And we're all excited. And I'm seeing so many things. God, okay, now it makes sense. It didn't make sense in the midst of the storm. And, and yeah, this is great. And things are going well. And then the 2008 and 2009 recession hit. Do you guys remember that? It wasn't that fun. How do you think it was for a church family? Because the church family supports itself and supports the church through its income. Guess what? Do basic math. When everybody's income gets cut down, the church's income gets cut down. It's just the way it is. And I mean, we have these different bills to pay for the church and, and for ministry opportunities. And all of a sudden, it's like I'm now three and a half going on four months behind on rent for the building. God, where are you in this? I mean, we've been, we've been faithful. We've been doing the right things as best as we know how. We've been preaching the gospel. We've been ministering to people. And, and now we're going to lose everything. And then God, again, shows up and shows us through it. But again, through all of those processes, working and molding and shaping, not only me, but so many within the church family. And then later on, there comes a time where I feel God's calling me to talk to a local pastor about two medium-sized churches becoming one church in Menifee. We have the, the same ministry approach. We ha have the same doctrinal approach. And we do the same thing. So often we're even doing ministry together. And so God put Ryan Sharp on my heart and I took him out to coffee and unloaded on him with this question of, what do you think about two churches becoming one? And you know, even in that process, I remember God working on me even months before I even had this conversation. And, and the things that were going through my mind, I got it, this doesn't make any sense. I, I, I'm, I'm my own boss now. I kind of like this head position here. I mean, it's nice. I can set my own hours. I mean, I have complete control. I, you know, I, I've got it and I, I can just do things the way I feel you're calling me to do it. And God's like, no, this is the step I need you to take. And for about two months, I wouldn't take that step. And then the Holy Spirit, known as my wife, stepped in. <laughs> and said, have you talked to Ryan yet? And we did. And I bring all that to your attention because there is this uncomfortable thing that takes place. But you've got to put one foot in front of the other. And do you realize that we're all a part of a church family called Impact that I believe so strongly in that I know God is going to do amazing things because he already has. And I know he continues to do those things. This is God's will. And walking through that journey, and I know you guys have your own stories. Man, sometimes it's super uncomfortable. Man, sometimes it's super uncomfortable. And you're like, I, 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 is, there's got to be an easier way. I mean, I'm just going to be really transparent. There's times in my ministry life where I felt like going back to the private sector has got to be a lot easier than this. Dealing with different situations and ups and downs and wouldn't it just be a little easier just to punch a clock nine to five and and do that thing provide for my family and I won't have to mess with this and God continues to tell me but this is my will for your life. Sometimes maybe you're like me and you understand and recognize God's will and you're like do you have any other plans. It's a challenge. And we see in this story that not only is it a challenge, let me follow up with this statement, is to realize that sometimes God's will isn't always safe. He puts us in these positions and it's like, wait, that, that, I thought there's supposed to be a safety net. Where's the security here? I mean, this is the story where Paul is literally being told, hey, it's unsafe to go there. I mean, they're going to do you bodily harm. Maybe just imprison you, but they might even kill you, dude. And he's like, that's what God's calling me to do. And I'm not backing down because it's unsafe. But we need to realize that God requires us to have a complete surrender. God's will requires surrender. Today, am I, are you willing to completely surrender to the will of God in your life? Knowing the complete truth. 
I mean, we read in Scripture where God says, hey, count the costs. God doesn't want some kind of false motivation out there. Hey, I want you to know exactly what you're getting into. Am I the only one that has discovered, you know, hey, you know, become a Christian and life's going to be so much easier is a bunch of baloney. Yep. It's just as hard being a Christian as it's being a non-Christian. I mean, you have a hope of eternity. You have a joy that's eternal. You can have a peace that surpasses understanding all of those things, but all of those things are eter internal, not external. But yet so often our will is determined by the things we see and feel around us. You know, God is more concerned with your heart than he is with your circumstance. God's more worried about the inner man and the inner woman than he is what's going on outside. I mean, that's the only way to make sense of these scriptures. I mean, God is obviously in love with Paul. Why would he put him in these situations? Continually in these situations. Why? Because God's glory is more important than yours, mine, or Paul's. He is God. And what he desires to do to be able to shape and to mold not only us, but people around us, is his will. And we've got to be able to say, God, that's got to be number one priority for me. Not my comfort, not my safety. But isn't that really the priority for most Americans especially? Security and comfort. I want to surround myself with this little invisible bubble so that I can continue through life so that it's safe, secure, and comfortable. And yet God says, I'm just going to be straight with you. Sometimes my will doesn't fit into that little bubble. That's your will, not always mine. And I say all these things not to just say, hey, you know what, uh, man up. But just be smart. Understand who God is and understand that the desire that he has for you is your heart. And why is that such a big deal? Um, because these bodies will be gone in 75, 80, 90 years. The inner man, that inner woman will go on for all of eternity. I mean, we've got to believe these truths and move forward in these truths, not just at some funeral say, oh, it's so good that Aunt Judy got to go to heaven and, and walk the streets of gold. Well, that's an awesome thing, but the reality is, is that is what God is all about. God's more about eternity than he is this temporary world we live in. Can we say the same thing? Can we say, God, I, I, I want to recognize your will. I, I want to accomplish your will. And the questions that we all have at this point of the message are, well, how do I know what the will of God really is? I mean, Paul's got this guy, you know, tying ropes around his hands and telling him what it is. And it seems like God is talking to him. Well, let me give you kind of the basic answers. Number one, tells us in Scripture that God's will for all humanity is, is that you would be saved. It says, God wills that none would perish, but all would have everlasting life. God's first will for your life is that you would recognize him for who he really is. You would surrender your heart to him and receive his son as salvation. And that he would become your Lord, your leader. Not only that, the Bible clearly states that God's will for all of our lives is that we would be sanctified. That means growing in our faith, getting stronger and stronger in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But yes, there's a specific will. And what I've discovered and with God's specific will is if you seek, if you knock, he will reveal those things to you. I tell you one last story about my own journey. You know, when I was at this point at one time in my life, just, you know, hearing messages from pastors and saying, hey, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life, and God has a call, and you have gifts, and all of these messages that we hear, and I'm just like, okay, well, I mean, I'm not sure what it is. How am I supposed to know these things? And I, I don't know. I, I have a desire to serve God. I, I want to, to be who he's created me to be, and I began to simply just cry out in prayer every day. God, my heart is to serve you. God, I want to know what you've called me to do. God, my life is yours. And I'll never forget, he revealed it to me in a concert. 
in a small auditorium about this size. Two or three hundred people in attendance and there's a, a band playing. And I remember just having my head down and crying out, God, I want to know what you've called me to do with my life. And then that still small voice, some of you guys have heard it. Some people think you're crazy when you say you've heard from God. It's not like it's this loud, audible voice where everything goes on pause and everybody looks around and goes, I heard that too. <laughs> it's kind of like almost a thought, right? It's almost like something that's in your heart. But God revealed to me, he said, Jeff, I want you to minister to these. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? And I lifted my head up and there was a sea of young people with their hands lifted up to the Lord. And I said, okay, God, I got the message. You want me to start ministering to youth children, youth kids. And so that started my journey and God molds and shapes and brings you along that journey. I give you that story to encourage you in your own relationship with God. Are you crying out and saying, God, I am willing. God, not my will, but your will be done. God, tell me what you called me to do. Not just generally, but specifically, I'm telling you from past experience, God is not trying to keep you in the dark. God wants to reveal it to you. The truth is, do you want the revelation or not? Some of us really don't want it. If we were being honest today, we would see like, eh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm good the way I am. I'm comfortable. I, I you know, have my security. Uh, well, then maybe you are asking God to follow your will instead of the other way around. As I stated from the very beginning, I realize even in forming this message and God working it through my own heart, this is going to be a hard pill to swallow for some of us. But it's the reality of the God that we serve. I don't want to get up here and give some kind of fluffy message about, hey, life's just going to be grand when you become a Christian. Never have a trial again in your life. It's all going to be, you know, butterflies and flowers. That's just not reality. I want to speak to you guys about reality and not only that, about the goodness of God. God is so good. I mean, I talk about this relationship being either based on our expectations of what we can get from God or just gratitude for what he's already done for us. Did anybody else have those moments? Maybe you still do where you're worshiping and you're thinking about God's salvation. I, I know who I was. I know who I still am. It blows me away that God wants to hang out with me. Man, I'm stinking rotten inside. I say bad things, think bad things, still do bad things. And that's when I'm cleaned up. And the God of the universe says, dude, I want to hang out with you for all of eternity. I mean, that should be enough, right? But yet we want to bring our own will into this whole game and say, well, and now that I've got that, I'll put that in my back pocket. Where do we go from here? Wait, uh, pastor, I've heard that scripture that says, well, Jesus has come to give me life and life more abundant. Can I just speak some truth into your life? The abundant life that you might have formed in your little physical mind is way different than the abundant life that God's will has for you. We think the abundant life is going to be more ching, right? Hey, we're going to get some more money. Maybe I'll win the lottery. I mean, I'm going to get some good things. This abundant life sounds awesome. God's like the abundant life is from the inside out, not the other way around. I mean, when you could be in the midst of a trial and find joy. Count it joy when you go through various trials. Anybody else read this one and just want to go, right? <laughs> like, seriously, how does that happen? That's a Jesus thing. That's an internal thing. Hey, um, you know, you can have peace that surpasses your own human understanding. And you're in the midst of chaos. And, and somebody tells you, hey, this is a, a scripture that you can hold on to. And you're like, hey, you got to be joking me right now. There's no peace. I can't see any peace. It's chaotic in here. It's crazy. God's like, yeah, because you're looking for it in the wrong place. I want to bring it inside of you, not all around you physically. We've got to ask God. God, today, do I trust you enough to completely surrender to you? I close with this challenge. Today, when you're honest before the Lord in his house, amongst his people, saying you've come to worship him in spirit and in truth, and to be taught his word of truth, would you be truthful with him? When it comes to 
a complete surrender to his will. Are you there? Are you at the place where you say, God's will is what I'll do. God's will is what I'll do. I pray that each and every one of us could leave this place and saying, God, I know things can get crazy. They always do anyways. But whatever it looks like, I want to sign up to do your will in my life. Would you guys?